So let's say I'm this evil uh, you know, client-side architect that, and, and you guys are the consultant uh, meeting me. So if I come with a problem that I want you to build a system, uh, it's going to have non-trivial use cases. It's going to have like millions, if not billions of data. And you need to respond, let's say, under two seconds. What would be your choice of a system? Let's make it interactive. This is a huge hall, but we have like 30 people. So what, what system would you recommend? Would you, you, can, you can say anything that you have worked with. So the, the key here uh, is, I know it's the most favorite answer is going to be it depends, but let's say that uh, the key is latency. So what, what kind of databases, what kind of uh, systems would you recommend? for? Uh, if it's going to be extremely fast, but you're going to have huge amount of data. Right, so Green Plum is one example. What else? Redis, OK, good. Yeah, let, 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 me, let me complicate it further. Let's say that you need to build a system that's going to be less than 100 millisecond. Fine, let's going to be less than 1 millisecond. Right, so I'm not making this up. Uh, so if you are, or if you have done anything with financial world, if you have worked with systems uh, where you have, uh, have you guys heard of high frequency trades? Right, so, so I'm not here to talk about the good or the bad part of high frequency trade, but the, the system part is like this. Uh, if you are a market leader, uh, the exchange gives you an advantage of 30 milliseconds, right? That's the edge that you have uh, over the others. Right? So if you are building a system that's going to leverage this 30 milliseconds of latency, right? what choices do you have? Right? So I'll, I'll begin the talk. Uh, so Q has been one of the leader uh, in this kind of a niche, high, high uh, throughput, low latency uh, you know, system to build, uh, language to build such systems. Right? So, but uh, nobody knows about it a lot because it's completely closed. Uh, but that changed last year, right? So, so the company KX decided, right, uh, if you have a future, then we need to do something about it. Uh, so let's give away the 32-bit, uh, you know, free, free for even commercial use, right? So if you're wondering why, why the catchy title, why is it called the language of God? Uh, what does God has to do with the language? Um, there is this awesome book uh, by Jeffrey Borrow called Q for Models, right? So if you are starting to learn the language, that should be the first book. And so I thought if, you, if there is a book called uh, Q for Model, then Q is probably the language of God. So, so that's the title. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to a little bit of history. So this talk um, will have a lot of examples. Um, so I'm, I promise you that. But we'll have a little bit of introduction, right? So uh, how many of you know APL? No, you're confusing. I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. How many of us know APL? No, no one. So, so APL is around 60s, right? So it was invented by Ken Iverson to deal with arrays, right? So and and then you had A plus, uh, and then you had K, and then you had Q, right? So all these languages, A plus, K, and Q, are written by one person, and um, that's Arthur Whitney. Uh, so if you want to know how how smart this guy is. Um, so when Ken uh, and Roger Hu, who's, who's the implementer of J, uh, when they're talking about, I want to do a second version of APL, right? So, so author wrote the code in like one afternoon, and it took one week for Roger Hu to read that and then do the first implementation of J, right? So J is still now heavily used in financial uh, academics and all of that. Right, so if you have this picture in mind, uh, why is this guy talking about something that is in 60s and 80s uh, in an era where we are talking about Hadoop, HBase, Apache, Kafka, and all that? Uh, yeah, have the thought. Uh, I have a good reason. Right, so we will come back to this slide. Um, so if you ask me what is Q or K to you, um, A, it's a mixture of real time. It can do streaming. It can do historic. Uh, it's a web server. It supports web sockets. It's a platform of multiple languages, uh, but we'll come to that later. So, so why did I pick up uh, Q? So I'm, I'm in no way related to KX, and I don't do projects for financial trading or any sort. But the only thing that actually excited me to learn the language 
is because it's freaking fast, right? It's faster than anything I've ever seen, right? So I've worked with quite a few systems that deal with a lot of data. Uh, but there is nothing when it comes to speed, uh, there's nothing that can match Q. And I'll prove that. And it's been extremely battle tested in production, right? So, it, so the Q, the language, or the underlying implementation has been around, uh, I'm talking server hours, so it, it has done millions and millions of server hours in production, right? And another aspect is, um, yeah, the big data ecosystem is pretty good, but if you ever, ever want to set up something, it's extremely complex, right? So if, you, if I want to maintain an Hadoop cluster, right? If you want to do something serious with it, uh, you need a flock of people to maintain. Not a lot, but still serious uh, energy put into you know, setting up, making it consistent, all of that. Right? And, and Q is extremely simple. Right? So most of the things is delegated to the OS, and that's about it. But so that, that's all the shiny part of it. Right? So if you are a beginner, Q is one of the most infuriating language you can come across. It's, it's extremely tears. There are not. I mean, there is a lot of documentation, but the community is, is really, really small. Um, so it can be very frustrated if you are beginning to learn Q. Um, I know you would have heard uh, Wenger talk about get beyond the syntax, but I'm pretty sure he will, he will think twice uh, if he sees the syntax of Q. But my plea is, yeah, you have to get beyond the syntax problem. And you definitely need to unlearn, right? So, you heard Scott talk about impedance mismatch, right? So if you are under the impression that the database language and the rest of the world have an impedance mismatch, may be true for the rest of the systems, but it's not true for Q. Um, so I was thinking, it's going to be nearly impossible for me to introduce a language with an audience who's not familiar with it, and it's going to be an unfair ask. And all of us have a very short attention span, right? So like the, like the blue guy there. Um, so I decided this format, I, I completely redid the format last night. Uh, it's going to be a series of myth busting, right? So we'll make it entertaining. Um, I'm going to assume that all of us know Q, right? I'll, I'll take a myth. You can, ex you can argue this is not a myth, uh, but this is a myth because I'm talking. <laughs> it is a myth for me, at least. Uh, we'll take a myth, we'll bust it with Q. Uh, when we actually solve this, uh, you will get to know. So if you have enough curiosity after the talk, I'm sure you'll pick up the book and read, right? Is that, is that good format? Some response? Cool, okay. Um, I'm going to get out of the presentation because I'm going to switching a lot. Is this okay, right, as a slide? Right, so <laughs> the first myth is that uh, you would have heard a lot of talks uh, in IoT. Uh, maybe in gates, maybe outside, that the sensors are coming and that's going to be the end for the server, right? The, your server is going to be bombarded with data uh, more than you can handle, right? And you need to do something about it. Um, someone was talking about throughput, right? So, so the example, this is going to be off my laptop, all the demos, I'm not, I'm not going to any server. So I'm going to uh, run the script. Uh, so what this is doing, uh, this is computing how much I can write to this DB, right? It's going to take 30 seconds. So what do I have? Uh, I have the time. I have the symbol. I have the price and how many stock I'm buying. Uh, because it's meant for financial institution, you can know that's the default, uh, you know, the script it comes up with. So that's your number, right? So you can do, if you are inserting a single insert every damn time, that's like firing insert into table commit every single time, uh, you can do 1.55 million a second, right? If you happen to batch in 10, 100,000, and so on, you can, you can see that it's actually peaking at, if you are, if you are batching your inserts to a table at 1,000 a second, it's gonna, it, it can do 333 million inserts a second, right? And that's just one. And you can, uh, if you have a multi-core, you can do four of these, right? And this is an example where I ran eight, Eight throughputs at the same period of time, right? So, so this myth that you can't handle data, you can't update as fast, you cannot drink from the fire hose. That's a complete myth, right? Uh, I'm sure it depends if you have a different volume of data, if you have more number of columns than what I'm using in this 
it's going to change. The mileage is going to vary. But you get the idea. You can do millions of inserts a second. Can I just declare this myth is busted? Fine. OK. All right, so I have about 10 myths. And the complexity keeps building. And the so is the interest. The first one, I think it's not so much. Um, but this is a, the second myth is that if you're doing something serious with the browser, right? What do you guys use to send data to the browser? What do you use? Question? Jason? I heard someone. OK, what else? Right, so yeah, so, so, so we are under this myth that the only way that you have to talk with the server and do it efficiently now is, is JSON. It used to be XML in the past. Uh, if you want to do something serious now, you use JSON. Uh, let's, let's go to the server. Let's say that, uh, can you guys see the terminal? All right. So I have a very simple test. Uh, I have an array of 1 million integers, right? So if you don't believe me, I'll go count. That's enough zeros. That, that's 1 million, right? So let's say that you want to stream this to date, uh, through your browser for whatever crazy uh, visualization you're building, right? Uh, let's do this in JSON, right? Let's see. Um, slash t is how you time scripts in Q, and this is the REPL of Q prompt, right? Let's say that uh, that's how you would stream into a JSON. So dot j dot j is uh, you can think of your JSON dot to stream, right? So that's going to take 2.7 seconds. Not bad for 1 million, uh, but it's still slow. Let's say if you can do this in binary, right? All right, so I'm going to, so minus 8 is the standard number to stream uh, the objects in queue to a binary format, right? So that's going to be 2 milliseconds, right? That's all good, uh, but it's binary protocol. You cannot, you know, send this to the browser. Let's see the second myth. Um, so what I have is, um, let me show you the code. Um, so I, I basically have um, a JavaScript given by KX, uh, the company, that deserializes the binary format to back to JSON so your browser can understand, right? Which is probably what you do. I mean, no one wants to do JSON because they want to do JSON. Uh, we opt to JSON because that's the only efficient way to talk to a browser, right? So what this is going to do, so there is a queue process running. It's listening on a web socket, right? And the moment I'm going to uh, get the data, it's going to get the data, not just get the data in binary. It's going to parse it to JSON and then display the message. Let's see how much time it's going to take. So that's about 760 milliseconds. Not just to get the data, to get the data deserialized to JSON and also display. No warp. <laughs> uh, any questions? Uh, or am I going too fast? Yeah. Yeah, this is all here. Oh, I'm not. I'm not doing product comparison here. Yeah. 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 So I'll I'll come to that. There are myths about clusters towards the end. So we'll park that for now. Um, are we okay so far? I mean, I just want to say that um, all of us, you know, uh, we don't embrace binary format because we we think it's evil. Uh, it's not portable. Uh, so we, we we kind of choose JSON as the default. So my plea is like, if you're not operating with a third party and if it it's a totally internal app, it's okay to do binary. Right. The third myth. All right, um, this is going to be hard. Um, if you have two systems and you're talking, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It does, right? So what I showed you is the complete round trip, right? 
So it takes two millisecond for the server to serialize. It takes about 766 millisecond for browser to deserialize. As opposed to sending two seconds to serialize to JSON, and then that's going to be a lot more payload to transfer to the browser. I'm sure browser is going to take some more time to deserialize it back to JSON. I mean, JSON parses still needs time. Right. Right. So, so, so we've been we've been brainwashed. I would say that uh, if you have two systems and use REST by default, right? And what I'm what I'm telling here is that. Uh, if you have a system that supports RPC very well, uh, um, you know, give it a shot. Right, so, okay. Um, tell me if you can see the two screens. Alright, All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this listen on 6000. Right? So it listens for the incoming uh, request on port 6000. I'm going to open a connection on 6000. So by default, you don't get uh, line wrap. So, so let's say. Right? So you have a handle. Uh, all right. So let's define a function. Let's make it trivial, right? So we just want to do an RPC. Uh, that's a function that takes a parameter and just squares and returns it, right? So if you want to call something simple, uh, you can put it in a string, and that gets sent from the process on the right uh, to the left. Uh, but let's say that this f is not defined here, but it's defined on this process. Let's say that I want to invoke that function and say on a square of 42, that's what you do, right? It's, a, it's an extremely simple RPC, but it works, right? And you can do a lot of crazy things. You can do synchronous and asynchronous and all of that. Um, but if you're thinking that uh, what I'm talking is rubbish, and I don't believe this because RPCs are evil, uh, please hold on to that. It's, it's easy to say that this will work only on Hello World uh, kind of trivial apps. Um, so, I, so the myth builds on one another. So we'll have a lot more series app building on RPC, right? And if you are following, it's going to be a risk for security to two processes to trust each other because I can, I can send really evil commands and kill the server. Yes, you can, uh, but there are ways to protect the queue server for security. Uh, if you're interested, you can look up. Right. Um, microservices. Who does microservices here? No one? Seriously, no? Okay. Have you heard of microservices? So, so what's so in your opinion, what's the problem with microservices? Anything? No. Okay. So, so I I work in a team where we like for the past three years we build really complex systems with, with like. Lots and lots of services, right? And I, so on the surface, things are good, but there is one big problem because of which people who are new to this kind of app uh, think that this is not, not going to scale. And that problem is now everyone, I, I'm sure everyone would have heard, you know, do the Unix way, right? See how pipe works and glue things together, right? That's not, that's the most difficult part of any system, right? If you have two, two, uh, two services built for different things, and you want to make them, uh, you know, you want to glue them with a pipe kind of architecture. That's not easy, right? And so, so I'm going to take one single example of a microservice problem that we have. Let's let's say I have like numbers, and I want to do a name lookup, right? Uh, don't do that in your app. Let ha let's have a naming service, right? Let's talk to the naming service. Let's enrich in runtime, right? This is one, I would say, a typical example uh, of aggregation problem in uh, microservice. Right, so that's the first myth. The second is the most interesting. Right, so how many of you um, actually uh, send data for visualization? Right, write services that crunches a lot of data. No, no, yeah. So, 
does it hurt when they say that you know you're sending too much data right you you spend a lot of time right you spend hours and hours you know shaving off 10 millisecond from the process and then you have the ux designer coming and saying no nah, this is too much i can't visualize all this data why don't you page name right it it really hurts because you do so much on the server but on the client when it comes to it right so no this is too much information right this to me is another myth right and they, and they encourage you to be lazy right let's do lazy loading all right so um what i'm going to try now is uh, i have data in the back end that i can see uh, that i'll show you we're going to request uh, quite a lot of data right uh, what you what that's going to be displayed in this grid i'm using grid for visualization you can think of anything else um i'm going to display the numbers uh, but i'm also going to do some part of aggregation as in uh, i'll do a name look up right and display the name so the architecture is going to be something like that right so the browser is going to talk to the queue process this is what is going to give you data but it doesn't have name so it's going to talk to another queue process it's going to enrich the name get the data send it back to the browser right and we are talking about let's say i want to send thousands and thousands let's see how the browser works all right um right so that's all it takes um it takes about 88 millisecond to send 24309 rows to the browser and trust me i'm not doing any kind of pagination so this is all this is all 24309 right no pagination whatsoever people should ask me questions now if you are following yes please Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is another aspect that I want to bust, right? So, this is another myth. I'm a data engineer. I only care about server. I don't care about the rest of the ecosystem. That's a wrong attitude, right? Like I said, so I've been part. So, I, I, I've implemented a really performant R process, and it, what really hurts me is that in the layers before it hits the browser, somebody will do something very trivial, and the performance goes down, right? So. i had this myth exactly for that reason right so if you are spending too much time on the server side spend equal amount of time in the ux uh, on the ui so the grid i'm using is called a hyper grid uh, if you're interested do look it up uh, it's an open source grid from open fin um so the financial world got very irritated that uh, you know if you actually go to any trading desks uh, you will see all terminal screens right so like 20 years old they want to do html5 but they have a simple problem that how do you display large amount of data right your slick grid and jq grid is not going to scale um so this was the problem that openfin was trying to solve and the answer is hypergrid right that's what i'm using um uh, it's extremely fast uh, if you ask me what on earth is displaying 24000 rows in 88 millisecond that includes complete round trip to the server and back to the browser is that oh any guesses how it does so if you if you are doing anything serious with dom it's extremely slow right in the end what do i want i, I want to just see the number right there is something else that's in html5 that's fast no <laughs> who said that right i'll show you this is completely not, not lazy i'll i'll kill the server and show you uh, no no so javascript is single threaded you can't do much even if you have workers and such that you can't do parallel so this is with websocket i'm not doing ajax because i i want to do binary because we busted that right i don't want to do json you can do json with ajax but i'm using websockets right so so there is something else in html5 and you'll be surprised what it is it's called canvas right so if you are doing a gaming you need to support 60 floating uh, 60 f what that floating point operations a second so canvas is really really fast at painting right so the grid there is no dom in it right it's just a canvas 
Uh, but it's, it's extremely flexible. I don't want to spend too much time, then it'll be a talk about hypergrid. Uh, but you can do a lot, lot of things with hypergrid, so do look it up. Right, so um, let's just prove that this is not lazy. I'm gonna, this is what, myth four? So this is what it is. I'm gonna kill this. I'm pretty sure I killed the right process. It's not gonna work because that's killed. Uh, but you can scroll. And I'm not doing any, any lazy load. It's not gonna do lookup on the server because there's no server. All right? Okay, there are more myths to burst. Um, so so my, my ask is this, so if somebody tells you be lazy, that's fine. Uh, that's the example from the book. Uh, but I, I seriously believe performance changes the way people use the app, right? Um, so if you can be eager, please be eager, right? And that's the link on the UI. Right? Okay. Right, so, so the next myth is even more harder. Uh, how, how many of you know how a SQL actually works? Right? You send a query to the server. I know exactly what the query optimizer is doing. I know exactly what the disk driver is doing. I know exactly how the data is getting fetched. You know? lot, lot many people, I, don't, I, I think this is going to be like one of those cases where uh, it's, like a, it's like a magic, right? It's like voodoo, right? I really do not know how the, how the actual DB works. Um, so, so let's see how this is the case in Q. I'm going to... So this is going to be a demo of how you can actually build uh, a, a DB kind of an interface in queue. All right, so I'll do, okay. So I'll start with the basic example. Uh, let's have a list of number, some random number, right? So L is a list. Um, anyone have used R before? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you can think of a list as a vector, right? It's all similar. And because it's a vector, what applies to an individual number applies to the list, right? So let's say that L greater than, let's say, 5, it's going to apply that to every element of the list, right? So what you get back is the vector. Right? Let's say um, there is a function called var, right, in the queue. Uh, what var does is if you uh, give a list of... Uh, binary numbers, it's going to give you the index of the element where it is 1, right? That's all that it is, right? So if you want to know what elements are greater than 5, you can chain it in, in Q. So L where L greater than 5. So what I'm doing is this is going to give me the indexes, and I'm going to index the list. That's like your equivalent of your where clause, right? And this is no cheating. This is exactly the principle. Uh, Q uses when you're running as a full-fledged DB, right? Okay, so let me let me build something complex, right? Let's build a dictionary. So in 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 Q, you can index a list with a square bucket, but you can also leave it, right? Uh, that's a syntactic sugar. So you can say name age, and you define mapping function, say whatever, and say something, right? So this is going to be a dictionary, right? Uh, what's the difference between a list and a deck? You can index the dictionary with anything other than a number as well, right? So like a symbol. So if I'm going to say what's the name that you have, it's going to come back. Let's say that I want to have something a little bit more. Let's say that I want to have a bunch of names and a bunch of age, right? Um, you can do something and something else. So. So this is, got, this is still a dictionary, but it has more than one value. Uh, but if you actually change this, if you can flip this, that exactly becomes a table. Right? So this is the table that we are used to. And then you can say, OK, something is flip of DD. And I can say select name from T. And that's going to work. Right? So, so this is. You can argue that uh, this is going to be a trivial example, but this is not. This is exactly how the DB works. Your select statements, your where clause are all a bunch of functions, 
operating on lists. Okay. All right. Okay. Myth number seven. If I'm going too fast, you can stop me. There's going to be 10 myths, and that's all. Okay. Myth seven multi core is hard. Uh, how many of us believe multi core is hard? Who? I mean, you guys work with systems that leverages multiple core, and how do you do that? Pardon? Modular X. I'm talking about leveraging a CPU. So, are you saying containerization or something like that? Okay. So, let's take that multi core programming is hard, right? So, the catch with Q is that um, Q is not free, uh, but the 32 bit version is free. Uh, that, but there is a catch. You, know? you can only address about 4 gig of RAM with 32 bit. And with 4 gig of RAM, is not, is, you can't do anything serious. And if you actually talk about the amount of data that you can address, it's actually just one gig, and it's not four gig. So 32 bit is extremely limiting, right? That's the reason it's why it's free. That could be a myth. Um, so this is, I'm going to buzz this. Uh, okay. All right. So um, I have a crazy visualization, so I'll tell you what it is. Um, so I work with retail, and one of the problems of retail is that uh, if you work with a retail that's very huge, let's say there are about 150 stores across the country, and you have people who are changing what has to be sold in the store, right? So the changes are, are like, let's say every week, the what is sold on a store changes, right? And actually, if you ask people in the store, they don't know what's changing. Right, because it's very hard for them to visualize. So this is about uh, the data that I have is about 156 million, uh, about 150 stores. And I'm going to do a simple visualization. This visualization is going to be for a given store in a given week. How many number of articles are changing? Right, pretty simple, but it's quite complex when you have 159 million and you want to do it real time, and you want to do end to end. Right, it's just not the query in the server, it has to go all the way to the browser. All right. I don't know if I clicked it. Right. Yeah, it's coming up. <laughs> so, so, can you guys see? So, people who saw this uh, for the first time, they, they were like stunned because you can see patterns now, right? Um, just by looking at the graph, you have similar set of stores, and there are other outliers that do not conform to the pattern. Um, so this is just an example that uh, there is no way you can do this with one queue process. Um, can you guys tell me how many processes I'm running? Just guess. Guess, guess, a number. I can't hear, sorry. So the data is not a lot, right? So uh, like I said, the, if you just count the bytes, it's about three and a half gig. Uh, but it's too much for a 32 bit, because you can hardly cross one gig and work with it. So I partitioned the data. But the, uh, the reason I'm saying this is going to meet the multi-core issue is that if you, I, I'm, I'm running on an eight core Mac with 16 gig RAM. So you can run a lot of process, right? Um, so I'm actually running 159 cubes. Right, and so I'll show the architecture. I don't think I have this version once again. It's 159 processes. Right. So that's the that's the architecture that's powering this demo. Is that your browser? So I was actually up how much can a Google Chrome take? Um, Chrome can, I guess, can take about 200 sockets at a time, right? Uh, usually, you're, if you're writing anything serious, you will only work with one web socket. Uh, but I just want to be crazy. Uh, so the browser is now talking to, you won't do this in production. You will have something in the front. But I just want to push the limit, right? So the browser is actually talking to all the 159 processes 
and and it does right so any questions in that yes so what what i'm demonstrating okay is the fact that if you can see the cpu cores is that if your data is too big i'm pretty sure even if you're running in 64 bit Beyond a point, it's not going to be practical for you to have everything in one process. So what I'm demonstrating is that if you have a problem, you can split it. You can run in multiple versions, multiple processes. You can leverage your multi-core. This is like you can, you can summarize as map reduce. I'm not doing map reduce, but something equivalent. Right? You can run in parallel and collect data and aggregate and still not do non-trivial apps with the free 32-bit version. That's what I'm, I'm showing. And if you thought that I, RPC I was showing you is only meant for hello world, it's not. I'm doing RPC as well. Okay. Can we go to the myth nine? So this is what I had. So you can think of it as uh, microservices on steroids that your microservice, if you think of it, is only going to have behavior and it's going to talk to one central DB. You can think of a process is going to embed both the data and the code, and it's going to be independent, right? It's probably the, the apex of your microservice that you can achieve. OK. Yeah. So. I was actually finding it difficult to form this myth. Um, I don't think it's a myth. Uh, people do use WebSockets. Uh, but I just want to show that uh, what is it on the server, right? So you've seen multiple examples where I'm talking. Um, so can you guys see that highlighted line? Right, so that's the, that's the implementation of, uh, what's the pointer? Yeah, so, um, so dot z dot ws, that's the default uh, function that you need to override if you want to do anything with the WebSocket. Um, you should be familiar with the minus eight exclamation, I'm going to serialize into a data. So values, you can read it like an eval uh, part. So again, this is going to be evil if you run in production because it's doing everything as an eval and, and completely trusting the client, but it's okay. So that's all you need to do for a WebSocket. So you just provide a function, uh, and that will this process will listen for an incoming request, and you will have a two-way communication. If you want to know the handle of the client that that is actually connected, um, there's another function. So it's basically so this is going to there is no client connected, but if it's connected, this is going to give you a table of uh, what's the handle and who's using it, right? Not a big, not not a very big myth, but yeah. Right. So someone asked this question: uh, How do you do clusters? Right. Um, okay. Um, so this is the setup. Uh, what this is going to be the same setup that I used to display the visualization, but I'm going to make a twist. Right. So let's say out of the 160 uh, stores that I'm having. Uh, if I'm interested in, say, one article, let's say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, sensitive to how case special as a conflicts is doing, right? I want to know uh, how, how many changes are happening to this article across stores over a period of time, right? So this is an example because I've partitioned every single thing. Uh, I, I, I just want to demonstrate a use case where uh, you don't have to talk to all the processes. You can just talk to one queue process and let the queue process orchestrate. So in this example, uh, the browser is going to ask to the queue. And then this queue process is going to talk to all the other process, do some kind of a reduce, and then give back. Right? OK. So um, I had a default article. So that's all it takes. So in this time, so you can visualize that, OK, um, there are 14 changes um, over 2003. 
and after 2010, it's going crazy. People are changing it a lot, right? Uh, so I just want to say that, yeah, you can't compare Q with MySQL clusters and all that, uh, but if you are clustering, so, so, the, so the underlying fundamental in QKDB is that uh, the platform only gives you a very basic set of primitives and you can build applications on top of them, right? And this is one example. All right. So there are, right? So if you actually look up, uh, there are libraries that help you do logging. There are libraries to do all that. Uh, but yeah, you, you can use it if you want. You are seriously want to use it in production. But you can build them. Right. OK. How many of you have heard of CEP? Right? Good. Can you explain what a CEP? <laughs> Can you explain what a CEP? So I think, yeah, so there is a lot, lot, many myths about CEP and what CEP exactly is, uh, right? So, so you, can, you can summarize as CEP as like the, the traditional data from a firehose. Uh, you can't take a lot of time to analyze. You need to analyze on the fly, right? So it's, it's kind of a stream processing, so to speak, right? Um, I'm going <laughs> to, as a disclaimer, I'm not going to demonstrate what it takes to build a CEP. I'm sure I can do it. But there is an excellent book called Q-Tips. Um, so if you actually go through the book from the first page to probably 10th chapter, by 10th chapter, you will know exactly what it takes to build a complete CEP. Um, it's, um, it's available for free. Uh, the code is. You can go look up in GitHub. Um, so this is the pattern that you would get to see in pretty much all IoT app. Right? I have a bunch of sensors. It's going to send me streaming data. Right? Say you, you are building something like a Bitcoin trading system. There are trades happening. I need to analyze. You can do it. Right, so, so this is the last. So if you're thinking, right, this is a platform, and this is doing so many things. Um, yeah, I shouldn't have flipped the slides. The size of the executable is just 512 KB. Right? And it's so small that it will sit right in your L1, L2 cache. Uh, why is it so small? It's because it's extremely optimized. And um, so if you're wondering, have you used multiple words? Like have you, I've said KX, I've said Q. Uh, I'm not sure I've said anything with the K. Uh, I just want to say that, you know, what is this uh, platform that I'm talking about? So in the center, you have K. K is, a, let's say, something, a lower level language of Q. And that's the bootstrapping language. It's implemented in pure C. And then you have a helper functions defined that's called Q. And then on top of it, you have functions to read and write, to file like, uh, some web, web sockets or all of that. They, they together form uh, the product KDB plus. Right, so you can, you can think of that. And now this is a platform to do a lot more things, right? Um, you can have a SQL-like language on top of KDB called QSQL. Right? It's, uh, you can build compilers on this platform. Uh, people have done that. Um, yeah, so yes, so the one, one scary thing is that, uh, as I said, 30 to bit is limiting. Uh, but you have to work around to actually, if you're trying to use it in production, uh, you need to partition and work with it. Right, so, so this is how my interest has been with Q. It's been up and down, up and down a lot. Uh, you read this, this is kind of weird. Where am I going to use this? Uh, it's always been a journey. But I thought, so, so since uh, April 2014, um, since they announced that 30 to bit is free for commercial, I thought I, I should give it a try and share with the community and see what it takes. And that's why I'm talking. Um, so if you are still interested, um, Arthur is working on the next version of uh, K, called K5. Um, so what is being built is one OS for anything from tablets to iPads to cloud, and that's called Chaos. 
Uh, this is being built for the past four years. I don't know when it's going to get released. I don't know when it's, is it going to be open source or not. Uh, but if you're interested, check out the article in Vector. It's pretty interesting to read. And there is also a video by, uh, I believe, one of the developers in the new kind of oper operating system that's emerging. Right? Uh, the link is in the presentation. And I believe that's all I had. You can ask questions. Community-wise, I don't know, but what I mean, it's like how many in real uses are they actually being used in this particular one, I mean, what this language is being used by? Right. So the question is, who is actually using it? Uh, pretty much all the banks in the world are using it. Um, you can go to kx.com and go to the customers. Uh, everyone from JP Morgan to all kinds of banks, almost all banks use uh, KDB+. Plus. High, high, high frequency trading platforms? Or yeah, is, is yeah, all kinds. Okay. If you're using backtesting, if you're doing risk analysis, uh, recently they won. Um, so we talk about IoT, right? So, um, so in US, uh, the system that actually going to record uh, the power meters, if I understand right from that press release, they evaluated a lot of products and they settled in, I'm going to use KX and KDB. Uh, so it's it started with the financial domain. It's now in pharmaceutical energy, Internet of Things, pretty much all. Questions? Right. Yeah, you just have to copy. That's all you need to do. Um, so I can, I can show you because I have time. Um, Right, so um, so if I go to a, that's the executable. Uh, you just have to copy your Q files, and that's all, and then zip and copy. So all the myth, and that's all is the code. You just copy the file, uh, and then set the path, and you're done. And this, uh, the interpreter is a single. Uh, it's a single. <laughs> okay, so I can I can show you guys this. I have five. Five minutes. Um, so I showed you that the bootstrapping language is K, right? And how is Q defined? Um, Q is defined as a one single file in K. And it's going to be a shock to read this, where that's the entire language, right? So if you're saying this language is not open, it's ridiculous. This is like reading the implementation of Java. And that's all is that Q.K is. Is all you need to know. If you can read K, you can change the language by just changing it here. So the bootstrap is a very tiny executable by K, and then it reads Q.K. Now, now the interpreter can support language Q, and then it can inter interpret anything uh, which is written for Q. Uh, can you create complex types and things like that? Is it, is that so different? it's um, yeah. So it is strongly typed as well. Uh, in the sense that if you have a list of, uh, let's say that I have a list of numbers, I cannot assign, that's not going to work. So if you're thinking of type checking, Q does something really, really clever to an extent that you need to be careful. Uh, if you think you can append to a list, uh, I, yeah, it's strongly typed as well. It's strongly typed, but dynamically inferred. You don't have to declare this is a list of integer if you don't have to. Cool. I'm sure somebody will look up. Thank you.